So my name is Max Dajan. I'm the coordinator of the Wilson Institute for Canadian History, and it is my immense pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the semester, Dr. Max Mischler. Uh, but first, a few words um, on this year's speaker series. Uh, this year's visiting speaker series is entitled Race and the Color of Democracy. We've invited a wide variety of scholars working on various periods, people, regions, uh, that will talk about race, racism, um, and democracy. So if you like tonight's talk, uh, definitely check out our website and social media for a full list of speakers. Now, our first speaker tonight, Dr. Max Mischler, will present a paper titled uh, Freedom's Carceral Landscape, Counterinsurgency, Incarceration, and Racial, Racial Formation After the Civil War. Dr. Max Mischler is, is Assistant Professor of American, and, um, of American History and the Atlantic World at the University of Toronto. He received his PhD from NYU, U New York University in 2016, and he was also a dissertation fellow at the McNeil Center for Early American Studies, where we met for the first time in 2014. Uh, we were colloquially known as um, Canadian Max and American Max, but I think sometimes you often went as original Max or real Max, and I went as fake Max, anyways. Um, <laughs> Max's work was definitely one of the highlights uh, of my time at the McNeil Center. Um, he specializes in transnational history, in the transnational history of the United States, uh, with a focus on slavery, abolition, incarceration, and uh, the history of capitalism. His current book manuscript entitled Civil Slavery, Punishment, Abolition, and the Origins of Mass Incarceration explores the intertwined histories of slave emancipation and penal servitude in the Atlantic world. Without further do, Max Mischler. So first of all, it's not March 19th, 2019, in case you were wondering. Um, I probably just switched it over. Um, so good evening. Um, first, I want to thank the Wilson Institute of Canadian History for including me in this wonderful seminar and speaker series and for hosting me here today. It's a delight to uh, get to know also other parts of Canada. I'm new to Canada. I sort of moved to Toronto and stayed there um, and learned very quickly that downtown Toronto is not necessarily Canada. Um, and I, one of the things I did get to do on my way to Hamilton today is go check out the Workers uh, Heritage and Culture Center in downtown Hamilton. I don't even know if I said that right, but sort of work, Labor History Museum. Um, which was very powerful and reminded me of the sort of important histories in cities like this um, and reminded me too of a time when I did honest work before I went to grad school. Uh, and uh, in some ways, maybe we could talk about this later if you're interested, sort of how I got from the labor movement to the history of incarceration and slavery and emancipation. I want to thank my friend and colleague Max for inviting me, for making this possible. Uh, we had a great time in Philadelphia. I don't think either of us knew that we'd meet back up here in Canada. Um, but I'm very happy to be here and happy to see him again. Now, when I sent the title of the talk, um, to be honest, I didn't have very much written. Um, and what I decided to do was use this opportunity to sort of flesh out some ideas that have been swirling in my head for a couple of years um, and to sit down and, and sort of write them down. <laughs> Ultimately, I think it was a generative and rewarding process. Um, but I should say this work is still... Uh, while it's related to my book project, it's a little bit different. It goes in a little bit of a different direction, it's still in its early stages. Uh, so I look forward to your questions, comments, criticisms. All of that, all of the above, are very, uh, would be very helpful to me at this uh, moment. Uh, I did want to say one thing that I might allude to a little bit later in the talk is that this is, this is, the story I'm telling is, is predominantly a U.S. story. But as I think you'll see, uh, it resonates with dynamics in Canada. And in particular, I uh, want to sort of acknowledge you know, that just in the recent week or so, uh, 2,800 names of indigenous First Nation children who died while in residential schools were sort of unveiled, that 1,600 other children uh, have not been identified and that there are hundreds and even thousands more who uh, went through that process. And I think you'll see that there's some uh, connections between what I'm talking about and what happened in Canada. And we can talk about that as well. Today, what I want to do is briefly sketch the contours of what I'm calling freedom's carceral landscape, uh, which sits at the intersection of Native American and African American history. 
um, as well as studies of U.S. empire and what I call the long history of mass incarceration. Uh, this presentation is necessarily incomplete, uh, but hopefully I can address some of the missing pieces in the Q&A. And I also want to uh, sort of say up front that starting with this image, there will be some troubling images in this talk and that I'm not unaware that reproducing those images can also kind of exact a kind of uh, or sort of reproduce some of the violence. And so I just want us to be aware as we use these images, right, to just remember uh, that they're usually capturing people in some of the worst moments of their lives. And I certainly don't mean to uh, casually use them. I'm using them for particular reasons. All right. In October, oh, well, this is it, eh? All right, we'll try this out. Uh, in October 1886, the U.S. War Department relocated nearly 500 Chiricahua Apache prisoners of war from southeastern Arizona to military prisons in Florida. Uh, the forced migration followed a decade-long war between Apache insurgents, led by the famous Geronimo, and the Union Army. Geronimo's surrender and, forced removal, and the forced removal of Chiricahua combatants and non-combatants to the opposite side of the country uh, signaled U.S. victory in one of the longest Indian wars of the 19th century. This is, this one I should have flagged for you guys. These are some photos taken of the Apache prisoners of war as they made their way across the bottom part of the United States from Arizona to Florida. And one of the things you'll notice is that U.S. empire in this moment is also making use of new mediums like photography, right? It's relatively new. It was sort of introduced during the Civil War. And these photos are not just sort of uh, attempts to capture, uh, in a double sense, capture uh, Native American warriors, but actually these are things that become quite important uh, for people back on the East Coast. And they become highly valuable commodities in some sense. Now, on October 25th, after an arduous two-week journey, the prisoners of war arrived in Pensacola. Uh, Geronimo and 15 fellow warriors were promptly separated from their families and detained at Fort Pickens, located in uh, Pensacola's sort of city's harbor. Uh, while the remaining women, children, and men uh, continued their journey to St. Augustine, where they were detained in another military fort, uh, Fort Marion. This is Fort Marion and St. Augustine. It's another picture of, Native, of the Apache prisoners of war in Fort Marion. And just to give you a sense of the geography, if you see sort of on the top right of Florida's panhandle is St. Augustine, and if you go directly across, sort of by the, ed, the edge of that red line, you'll see Pensacola. Right? So this is not just the removal of Apaches to Florida, but once they got there, the separation of families uh, to opposite ends of the state. Now, this forced migration reflected an evolving U.S. counterinsurgency strategy premised on removing indigenous people from their land, food supplies, and history while opening up territory to white settlement and corporate capitalism. One of the big questions for architects of U.S. empire was whether to pursue a, con a, a policy of, quote, concentration, that is, concentrating all of these Native Americans in one, quote, unquote, Indian territory in Oklahoma, or diffusion, Right, which is separating uh, enemy combatant Native Americans into different reservations. Right? And I guess I want to flag that because both of those are carceral solutions. Right? Reservations uh, are, are carceral spaces, as are uh, these sort of large agencies that they're building in, in, in Oklahoma. Both were carceral institutions that involved forced migration and resettlement. And I should add, it's not in the paper, but I should add, also involved forced labor. We don't tend to think about uh, the Indian wars of the 19th century as being about forced labor, but they certainly were. And on a more concrete level, they required the federal government to utilize or construct a vast network of military jails to confine indigenous prisoners of war. And if you look at this map, one of the things you'll see, right, the red uh, uh, symbols are for actual battles and the black ones are for military force. And these have tended, that people have tended to look at these as sort of examples of the US military, uh, sort of US military strategy. But one of the things I'm trying to do in my work is to remind people that each of these forts was also a prison. They're not just forts, right? And 
Thousands of Native Americans are being incarcerated in them. Indeed, Apache prisoners of war were not the only Native Americans forcibly removed to military prisons in Florida during this period. Fort Marion had been a site of indigenous incarceration for well over a decade by the 1880s. In May 1775, following the 1873 to 75 Red River Wars in the Texas Panhandle, 75 Cheyenne, Cayenne, Kiowa, and Comanche prisoners of war were also transported from the Southern Plains to Fort Marion under the command of Captain Richard Pratt. Just remember that name. He's going to become important to this story. Just to give a sense, that's where most of the war took place, right, in that, right where those arrows are pointing. And those are the various forts from which military units uh, proceeded. And you can see that in Oklahoma, they have these new agencies that they're building, which is basically sort of mass reservations surrounded by military units. And then in this region where the war is, where Native American groups who were resisting uh, being relocated. And these are photos, again, of, of these earlier uh, prisoners of war in Fort Marion. Now, one of the sort of interesting sources that I'm, I've been sort of using for this project is a series of paintings done by indigenous prisoners while, during their incarceration in Fort Marion. And these are from this earlier group of uh, sort of enemy combatants from the Red River Wars. Right, the, and a, a sort of such a painful statement, melancholy prospect from Fort Marion. Um, this is a drawing one of the prisoners did of the wars. Now, following three years of incarceration, these particular prisoners in 1878 were either removed to quote unquote Indian territory in Oklahoma were sent to pursue a formal education on the East Coast. Some, in fact, traveled to Hampton Institute in Virginia, a school that had been developed for recently emancipated African Americans, while others traveled with Captain Pratt uh, to Pennsylvania, where he established the famous or infamous uh, Carlisle Indian Industrial School in 1879. By 1886, when the Apache prisoners arrived in Florida, the Carlisle School was a thriving genocidal enterprise. This is the image I used for the talk. Pratt summed up his vision, you probably know this, Pratt summed up his vision for, quote, Indian education uh, better than anyone. A great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one, and that high sanction of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment but only this, that all the Indian there is in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian, kill the Indian in him and save the man. Right. Ultimately, the US War Department would forcibly remove 44 Chiricahua Apache children from their mothers and families at Fort Marion and send them to Carlisle. And just to kind of uh, sort of beat this point to the ground, I, I want us to not think about school and prison as distinct. When we hear about children being sent to school, right, we need to think about those as carceral spaces. And these are uh, photographs of the Apache children in uh, uh, Carlisle School. And of course, we see here that photography is not merely, again, something to capture uh, objective events. right? It's used to promote the uh, sort of cultural genocidal aspects of the school. Now, as scholars in both Canada and the United States have shown, boarding schools, industrial schools, reservation schools, all need to be understood as carceral spaces of unfreedom that epitomize what Patrick Wolfe calls the logic of elimination. They were not distinct from military prisons or reservations, but rather comprised parts of a unified whole. The forced migration and incarceration of Apache people was but one piece of a larger national pattern. Right? And again, this is just one story. If we have time at the end, maybe I'll tell you another story about Hopi peoples from Arizona who are also forcibly removed to California. Right? So when we look at these forts, again, not only are they prisons, but they're conduits for forced migration. People are passing through them and being put on trains or in wagons and shipped out to different parts of the United States. 
Native Americans, however, were not the only people targeted for incarceration and relocation during this period, nor were they the only people forcibly removed to parts of rural Florida. At the precise moment that Union soldiers were waging war on Native Americans in the West, Southern Redeemer governments and their white constituents declared an all-out war on recently emancipated African Americans that culminated in the mass incarceration of black men, women, and children. So one of the things that I stumbled on while doing some of this research is if we know where St. Augustine is, right? And we know where Pensacola is. If you can see, right, not quite dead in the middle, but sort of closer to St. Augustine, but in the middle, there's a little town called Live Oak. I'm just going to point to it. The forest of north central Florida, located roughly midway between Pensacola and St. Augustine, were the epicenter of one of the most exploitative and violent convict lease systems in the south. Right? So right here, the same part of that Florida, uh, northern Florida. Following the defeat of Reconstruction in 1877, Florida's neo-Confederate uh, government developed a sophisticated convict lease system that generated a large reserve of unfree labor, indispensable to extractive capitalism in the, quote, New South. This regime institutionalized white supremacy at bargain prices. African Americans were systematically criminalized, policed, and incarcerated in record numbers during the 1880s. And a majority of black convicts were subsequently leased to private merchants, such as HAYs of Live Oaks, who in turn subleased their bound laborers to northern turpentine and naval stores firms. So in this part of Florida, the main uh, industry was uh, turpentine, which is used for naval stores, for building ships and various other industries. And I just want to, so this is an actual image of a turpentine camp from north central Florida. Uh, but one of the things I just wanted to flag is that while we, th we think of these as southern convict lease systems, right, I mentioned that the funding, the capital for these unfree labor regimes is mostly coming from the north. So this is a national political economy that involves uh, northerners who ostensibly uh, oppose uh, southern Jim Crow or southern uh, violence in this period. It's not Jim Crow yet, but. Apache prisoners of war and African-American convicts embodied a vast racialized carceral archipelago that connected disparate parts of North Florida in the 1880s, 90s, and well into the 20th century. Their captivity derived from two racialized counterinsurgency campaigns waged by different branches of the government in the service of regional political economies following the American Civil War. Spread out across the continental United States, military prisons, convict lease camps, penitentiaries, frontier garrisons, reservations, municipal jails, prison farms, and residential schools all served as repositories for unfree Native and African American casualties of war. These institutions comprised what I'm calling freedom's carceral landscape. And I just want to sort of explain why I put this map on here. This is a map of railroads uh, in 1890. And one of the main way historians think about the sort of the way in which the continental United States was consolidated was through the prism of railroads and railroad expansion, right? But what I'm asking us to do is to think about military forts and incarceration also being critical to the consolidation of national territory, to co continental empire, right? And here we have uh, convict laborers in the South building the actual trains, right? So sometimes when we look at maps like this, we lose sight of the labor that made it possible, and in some cases, unfree African-American labor, in other cases, exploited immigrant labor, uh, but we also lose sight of the wars, right, that are making this kind of uh, national development possible. Now, to make sense of this requires putting the U.S. Civil War and U.S. Empire in the same frame. And this is something historians like Stephen Hahn and others have been trying to do for some time. And I'm going to try to do it here today as well. Uh, during the American Civil War of 1861 to 65, an unprecedented African-American insurgency against slavery, what the great scholar W.E.B. Du Bois called a black general strike, undermined the Confederacy from within and changed the course of American history. 
Union victory in 1865 eviscerated slavery's empire, and the 13th Amendment to the Constitution abolished slavery. These developments, however, only raise more questions about what exactly constituted freedom and provoke pitched battles over the specter of African-American citizenship. The project of settler colonialism, meanwhile, failed to dissipate amid the fratr fratricidal violence of civil war. But war did reconfigure settler colonialism. The powerful nation state, or Yankee Leviathan, that emerged from the ashes of the Civil War turned its gaze to the West. The now massive Union Army, uh, the now massive Union Army's pivot back to its imperial roots proved devastating to Native Americans and put the nail in the coffin of Native American sovereignty in North America. And I just want to sort of why am I harping on this? In part, it's because historians, including myself, we often look back to the Union victory in the Civil War and to Reconstruction as one of these great moments in American history where another path was possible, where African-American citizenship was on the table, where equality could have been something we really won through these constitutional amendments. And I'm suggesting that while that's true, for Native Americans, that was never the case. There was no pathway that could have worked out well for them, given how things developed with the Union Army. Westward expansion and the African American insurgency of 1861 to 1877 each provoked stubborn reaction. Native Americans resisted white settlement and sought to establish territorial sovereignty in the face of perpetual aggression. Uh, but this resulted in protract, protracted asymmetrical warfare in the West that at times approached outright genocide. And maybe we can talk about that distinction between elimination and genocide that Patrick Wolf uh, has sort of given us. Ex-slaveholders and ex or neo-Confederate soldiers, meanwhile, viewed Union occupation and African-American freedom as existential threats to their society, to their economy, indeed to their very sense of self. Lee's surrender at Appomattox marked not the end of war, but its reincarnation as a paramilitary struggle aimed at subjugating free African Americans in the South. Congressional Republicans, of course, responded by taking control of Reconstruction, passing sweeping legislation such as the Civil Rights Act, and securing passage of the 14th and 15th Amendments, so-called Equal Rights Amendments, to the Constitution. And it did have an impact. Reconstruction did facilitate, for a moment, and in some ways, the political emancipation of African Americans. Indeed, what white Southerners correctly, in my opinion, called black Reconstruction, though their usage had racist connotations, amounted to a prolonged black political and military insurgency against white supremacy that flowed from the barrel of the gun. And I put these two images here on purpose because, again, when we think about Reconstruction in the South, we think about the Reconstruction Amendments, we think about the Union Army, we think about African Americans going to uh, vote. But I want us to be really clear that all of that depended on African Americans having and using guns. And when you ask, as a great work being done right now, on what African Americans, when they were asked what freedom meant to them, what they wanted, Right? when they actually interviewed former slaves, uh, voting was not number one or number two on the list. Land and guns. They had a very clear sense of what was happening, and they knew that the vote was not going to get it done. Right? This is what made possible black reconstruction. And yet, radical reconstruction did require sustained military occupation of the South and would survive only so long as Republicans refused to forfeit their wartime powers uh, by declaring an end to the war. And if you want to read an interesting book about this, Greg Downs has a great book called uh, After Appomattox, where he sort of makes the argument that literally the war didn't end, end until congressional Republicans declared it over. And they didn't declare it over to keep war powers so they could occupy the South. In 1877, Republicans sacrificed black freedom on the altar of national, i.e. white, reconciliation, securing the presidency for Rutherford B. Hayes. Congress slowly reintegrated white Southerners into national politics and withdrew Union troops from the South. 
Indeed, they often redeployed these very same soldiers who had been a force for liberation in the South, West, right, to fight the Indian Wars in the 19th century. By the late 1870s, the Republicans had all but abandoned their black allies in the South. And so during the 1870s and 1880s, these developments precipitated two distinctly regional counterinsurgency campaigns. While the federal government waged wars of extermination and relocation against Native Americans in the West, Southern state governments waged their own revanchist war against nominally free African Americans in the South. And just to give you a sense of, of the geography of what I'm talking about when I say the South, right? So these are the Southern states that are seceded, and this is the Black Belt, which is also the Cotton Belt, but it's where the, uh, you have the highest number of African Americans living in the South. The Southern War, as opposed to the one in the West, uh, was itself multifaceted, involving paramilitary terrorist organizations like the Klan, Democratic Party, prison administrators, local magistrates, and indeed the entire white civilian population. Their tactics famously included murder and lynching. Right, So you can see that the terror of lynching maps on perfectly almost to where the black belt is. Right? And this is a little bit later. It's data compiled by the African American College Tuskegee Institute on lynchings from 1900 to 1930. And you get see again, right, uh, concentrated right where African Americans are living in the South. But Southern state governments also facilitated the rise of racialized systems of debt peonage and, of course, the mass criminalization of African Americans and their subsequent incarceration or subjection to forced labor on behalf of private companies in the state. A vast carceral web emerged out of these simultaneous, decades-long counterinsurgency campaigns. And if Walter Johnson has drawn our attention to slavery's carceral landscape, I'm interested in reconstructing freedom's carceral landscape, one that I think anticipated US carceral colonialism abroad and 20th century mass incarceration at home. So what are the stakes of this project, right? One, I think it allows us to incorporate more fully Native Americans into the study of race, punishment, and contemporary mass incarceration in the United States. Scholars have attributed the rise of the US carceral state to the expansion of federal power, law and order politics in the civil rights era, and neoliberalism in sort of the late 20th century. Historians, meanwhile, trace the deep origins of mass incarceration to the Southern convict lease system, to the chain gang, and to the social scientific construction of black criminality at the turn of the 20th century. The long history of Native American incarceration has been largely excised from this genealogy. This is most unfortunate given that US military prisons confining Native American insurgents in the late 19th century comprised America's first federal carceral apparatus long before the birth of the FBI and the Federal Bureau of Prisons in the 1920s. On the other hand, studies of American empire do consistently trace US counterinsurgency strategies back to the Indian Wars of the 19th century, but this narrative elides the anti-black counterinsurgency in the South which contemporaries clearly understood to be a military coup against black reconstruction. I think we need to integrate late 19th century African and American and Native American histories through the prism of carceral counterinsurgency. Doing so will allow us to desegregate the intertwined histories of Native Americans, African Americans, and US empire. Such a move, however, requires a nuanced understanding of power capitalism, and empire, since we're not actually talking about one single war, but rather two distinct, overlapping, and even, we could argue, at odds, counterinsurgencies that were simultaneously undertaken by southern states and the federal government. Indeed, proponents of federal counterinsurgency against Native Americans could be found among the most vocal opponents of the southern variety. To the degree that the US has consistently maintained domestic and foreign carceral apparatuses, I argue, both emerged out of the US post-Civil War counterinsurgencies aimed at removing obstacles to white empire and capital accumulation. The birth of a global American empire by 1900 represented a pivotal turning point in American history. But US and Jim Crow counterinsurgency continued to shape American military strategy in the Pacific, 
Latin America, and the Middle East well into the 20th and, unfortunately, the 21st centuries. So the Civil War opened up space for an African-American insurgency that facilitated Union victory and culminated in Black Reconstruction. Eventually, Republicans abandoned Reconstruction in favor of national reconciliation, implicitly sanctioning a brutal counterinsurgency against African-Americans in the South that in some ways has yet to end. For Native Americans, the Union Army never represented deliverance. The federal government remained an untrustworthy adversary simultaneously committed to expanding national territory at the expense of Native peoples and to defending the rights of predatory white settlers. For Native people of the West, Union victory unleashed a reinvigorated campaign of elimination. The Army of Liberation in the South became a genocidal force in the West. Freedom amounted to an ethnic cleansing on a continental scale. These interrelated counterinsurgencies relied on a vast carceral landscape that, like the railroad, made the continental United States possible and provided a scaffolding for U.S. carceral empire in the 20th century. This landscape was not a legacy of chattel slavery, but rather one of the more bitter fruits of liberal freedom. And I want to just end here. Anyone want to know what this is? It is a prison. It's one of America's most famous prisons. It is Alcatraz, and this is from nine, this is from the American Indian Movement's takeover of Alcatraz, right? And I want to end with it again to remind us that Native American takeover of Alcatraz lines up with the sort of transition to the rise of mass incarceration in the United States. That Native people in the West, in the Pacific Northwest, in California, in Arizona, in Minnesota, in Utah are disproportionately incarcerated in the United States, right? And then in some ways, the counterinsurgency campaigns that I've been describing of the 19th century uh, not only live on, right, but uh, continue to forcefully relocate men, women, and children from their homes to prisons. I'm gonna leave it there. There's more that could be said. Uh, but I'm hoping that we can get into it in the Q and A. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, sort of some. At this point, I'd much rather hear what you have to say and, and any questions or comments you guys have. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Questions, comments, concerns? Uh, I really, this is, this is great. I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. Uh, fascinating stuff. Um, I guess I have a, a, a couple of questions. Um, uh, I'll start with just one. Mm -hmm. um, there's been some Canadian work recently that has tried to, um, tried to write um, the public health kind of issues in hospitals into this. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if that has come up in your research of using things like yep. tuberculosis yep. um, If we could imagine that as part of this yeah. carceral landscape along with schools and, uh, and, and prisons. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to give you an example. Actually, there's a question you asked when you asked me in the beginning, what's carceral mean? Right? And I, and I say I'm using the word intentionally in the way Foucault meant it, not in the way it's sometimes used. I think sometimes it's still used to mean prison. But he was precisely talking about uh, sort of an institutional approach that transcends prison walls. So yes, hospitals, schools. Um, one of the things that I'm sort of working on now, I, I don't know if it's going to form part of this, but it might be separate, is sort of thinking about um, focusing more specifically on kidnapping and stealing children, because that's one of the key definitions of genocide. And it's Canada and the United States seem, not the only states, Australia too, but certainly the states I write on, the United States and then the place where I live, Canada, seems to have a perverse fascination with stealing children. And we can trace that not only from the story I'm telling the United States and of course the one here in Canada, right, but all the way up to immigrant detention today. Um, and, and, so, and to go to your point, there's a place in Florida that was known as a boys' school. That's how it was known by historians. That's how they talked about it. 
No one really wrote about it. But a group of archaeologists did a dig at this boy's home in northern Florida, right next to where I, the place, uh, sort of the area I was talking about. And in their excavations, they started encountering uh, a lot of bodies. And these were African-American children as young as seven or eight, uh, all the way up to 17. And they just died. And no one told their parents what happened to them. Um, no one knew what this was, but it was a, it was a to sort of invoke uh, Ed Baptist's sort of notion of torture, this was a, these, were, these were torture sites, right? Where children were stolen from their parents, made to work, and died. And I think the more we look, I guess what I'm saying is the more we look into institutions that we don't think of as prisons, the more we're gonna find that, particularly when we're dealing with racialized others, right? There's just a, this, this, this ability uh, to turn any institution into a space of forced labor, into a space of medical experimentation. I'm thinking here even of uh, Deidre Cooper Owen's new work, Medical, uh, uh, the title will come to me, which has this great new book on American slavery and the origins of gyne American gynecology. Mm -hmm. And the whole ways in which African-American women, enslaved African-American women were subjected to medical testing that s historians and the AMA continue to treat as a legitimate uh, science. Um, and I think the more we look into this, we're gonna find it everywhere. Not to be too depressing, but I think you're right. Absolutely, hospitals, schools. Um, and I think, you know, it gets complicated. And for example, when you look at some of the uh, freedmen schools set up by Northern missionaries after the Civil War, uh, some of them had active participation by African Americans. And when you, I think the schools where African Americans played a leadership role and controlled the terms of education, you're gonna find less abuse than in schools controlled by Northern missionaries. And, and, and white folks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned early on that in addition to thinking of those, the network of forts that you meant, that you showed a map of, hmm. thinking of them as military forts, but also as prisons. Could we extend that understanding back into the fur trade period? Because hmm. um, I'm just thinking of the same sort of network of forts that in Canada, the HBC and the American Fur Company might have had. Hmm. Extending into the West, and I'm just wondering how far back we can we can move we can use that understanding because it, it it struck me as like you know there are all these forts that dot the Canadian West and up mm -hmm. in the North, often called like that were owned by the Northwest Company, mm. the BC, but they're usually seen as more trading posts. But I hadn't thought of them. Yeah. Said you should think of forts as prisons yeah. as well. Not, I don't know. Not, yes, I think we should, but in some ways, right, this points to the, the kinship between the prison and the military barrack. And this is, this is from the outset, right? This is, again, not to overly quote Foucault, but I think he's useful on this particular question. Uh, right, when, if you think about the prison as a kind of assemblage of different historical architectures, right, the military barrack is precisely one of them. It's regimented, it's organized, and we have to remember that going all the way back to, to sort of early modern European armies, that the fort is also a place of disciplining military labor, impressed soldiers, soldiers who don't want to fight or desert. So the fort is always a disciplinary space. And I think we can definitely bring that across the Atlantic, not only to the early fur trade, but of course, what do they call the, uh, you know, the British, French, Dutch trading posts on the west coast of Africa, forts, factories. And as Stephanie Smallwood has shown us, uh, those were factories of incarceration, right? That's where the commodification of African captives took place. So you're absolutely right. And I hadn't actually thought about sort of making that step, um, but I think I will. And I'll get your name and I'll thank you for it. Uh, but no, but I, it's right. It's like, yes, we have to, in both of the comments, it move, be, move beyond the prison and really move beyond the prison, and then also maybe move the genealogy further back to even what I'm doing. Well, because I just think as well, that, like, you could also extend that map north, because I noticed some of the dates in sort of mid-80s. Mm -hmm. At this time, the Northwest resistance is being fought in Canada, mm. where, where Métis people are right. fighting the Canadian Which I just learned about. <laughs> are fighting the Canadian army, right? Right. So, like, I'd assume there is a, there's a similar map of forts that you could, that you could uh, connect up through Canada. Yeah. I, I, I think I need to look into that, and maybe also I would add 
of course, if you're, if you're looking, this is also a moment of uh, labor radicalism and the federal government using the army to suppress strikes. So the carceral landscape of freedom is also one in which white, native-born, and immigrant workers are being incarcerated in some of these same places, right? If you think about the mines in Colorado, right? Or some of the, of course, moving over to the Great Lakes area and the industrial, rising industrial centers, when these strikes are suppressed and the people are arrested, they're also being put in jails, right? So it's why I like the term freedom's carceral landscape, even though it's a little bit jargon, it's a little heavy on the jargon, I like it precisely because it allows us to not get bogged down in, in one space, right? But to think about how states, and, and really important to remember, states, but also um, to your point about the fur company, that even, even in some places, uh, corporations have a kind of quasi-jurisdiction or sovereignty where they can mobilize prisons too. So it's, and that goes back to the East India Company in the in case of the British Empire, right? Where the East India Company has literal police powers where they can incarcerate. As, right. So there's a, there's a, yeah, this is, it's, I need, I need to think more about it, but I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. I, it's funny because when I went to grad school, I, I in some ways went with this idea that I wasn't going to write about anything that was explicitly political. I, uh, I was admitted, actually, to work on early, early sort of Atlantic world imperial histories. I find them interesting, and I spent 10 years working uh, in the labor movement as a member, as an organizer, and I kind of needed a break. Um, and yet, to be honest, you can never really escape labor. It's everywhere, right? It's everywhere. Somebody's doing something for somebody. And it's, you know, even though I, th I, think, I think of myself as a historian, maybe of prison or slavery and emancipation, all of those are labor systems. Um, but I, I think the reason why I was drawn to them is my particular union in New York is called Local 32BJ, and it's predominantly uh, building service uh, workers. And building service, which could be porters, janitors, is one of the few industries in which people who are formerly incarcerated can get jobs. So my union had a very high percentage of people who had been incarcerated. And one of the things that I was able to see was both the importance of collective organization for people who have been incarcerated and traumatized by that experience, but also the ways in which no matter what they did, they were still not free. The collateral consequences of mass incarceration are such that you're never really out. You can always be put back in, especially in the United States, which I know best. And I think for me, the, the, this question of what is freedom, that's a question that emerged for me in the 21st century and I, were, I walked it back to the 20th and the 19th and the 18th. Um, and I've since discovered for myself that I, I think freedom is, um, as, an, as an analytical category, is almost worthless. As a category that social movements employ, it has value, right? And I think, so I separate those two things. I'm not gonna tell social movements not to use the word freedom, but for historians to use freedom uncritically, it's like, what are we talking about? For who? Exactly. For who? Majority of Americans are not free well into the 20th century. Black or white. Right, exactly, exactly. And I think maybe to your point, actually, there could be something useful about maybe integrating white immigrant workers into the story to, to really highlight the ways in which systems that can be explicitly racial and racist also target and impact uh, white citizens as well. Uh, yeah, thank you for those questions. This is great. Thank you. Yeah. Just following on what you were saying, that's an amazing phrase. There's the bitter fruits of liberal freedom. <laughs> <laughs> that could be a great book. Anyway. Yeah. But uh, it made me wonder how is this handled in the liberal mainstream in terms of the, the period itself and then subsequently? Because 
some of what you're saying has, must have a sort of shock of revelation for some of your audiences, mm -hmm. I would think. So doesn't that tell us how a kind of liberal hegemony handles really the precondition for its own existence? And yes. And kind of has to, ideology, you know, has to structure the ideological. So I just want to yeah, that's a great question, and this is actually something that my book takes up explicitly, because one of the questions I sought to answer with my book was my first book, which is not out yet, but it should be soon, is uh, why are historians so surprised that freedom isn't free? I mean, they, historians still write books about the aftermath of slavery, in which the the way they narrate the story is that emancipation was supposed to produce human emancipation, and this is sort of uh, not to be not to bring it back all the way to 19th century, but this is sort of Marx on the Jewish question, right? What's the difference between political and human emancipation? And I think liberal historians still expect political emancipation to deliver human emancipation, and they're surprised when it doesn't. Whereas I ask a different set of questions, which is what did the actual uh, policymakers and liberal theorists of the 19th century, what did they actually envision when they meant, when they said freedom? And they never envisioned anything but coerced, uh, regulated, policed labor. In fact, so in the, I think in the 19th century, I think they were more honest. The people I write about would not have said, freedom is you get to do what you want. They had a much more Rousseauian ver view of this, right? We can force you to be free. And if freedom is wage labor and you don't want to do wage labor, this is the case, and again, this is the case for Native Americans and African Americans. One of the things that you see on these reservations is Native Americans being subjected to forced labor. Why? They think that forcing them to work will inculcate habits and teach them to be wage laborers. Why are African Americans convicted of trespass and vagrancy? Because they don't want to work for wages on plantations. So this is part of the reason, and I think this is important, I don't mean to go in too much on this, but. As you may know, there's a lot of conversation about the 13th Amendment and the origins of mass incarceration. The 13th Amendment was not the product of Southern slaveholders. No slaveholder wrote it. No slaveholder endorsed it. The 13th Amendment, which includes a criminal exception clause, was authored by committed abolitionists. And until we grapple with that, that abolitionists, when they abolished slavery, knew full well that they were making an exception for penal slavery. That they didn't mess up. They knew what they were doing because they thought they were fundamentally different because some forms of coercion are legitimate and other forms are illegitimate. Right? And so I think that's where you start to see, I think what happens in the 20th century is liberals get very uncomfortable with the fact that there's all these realities that don't line up to what they think freedom should be. But that's not actually the history of liberalism. Uh, My other question. Yeah. Uh, I, I, it's really neat how you show sort of the, the physical movement of people. Mm. It's, it's fascinating. Um, but I want to come back sort of to the realm of ideas. And oh, yeah. thinking of um, if, if you've been able to trace how um, how, ide how how sort of the, the nuts and bolts of how to how to imprison somebody, mm. how, to, how to run these facilities. Um, is there an exchange of ideas that is visible to, you know, the kind of sources that you're working with? Yeah, I, there is. So one thing that's important to remember, of course, is that the Civil War is the largest mobilization, armed mobilization in American history, largest casualty rate in American history. It's the most significant war still to this day in terms of deaths, in terms of people who engaged in the conflict, and in terms of the numbers of prisoners of war. So part of what happens already during the war is both the South and the North have elaborate prisoner of war camps. And they're starting to think about sort of legal questions about what rights do prisoners of war have. Um, one, of the, one of the interesting sort of conflicts in, during the war, of course, is uh, the Confederacy refuses to treat African-American Union soldiers as soldiers. And Lincoln takes, makes the decision, to, he basically says, well, we're not gonna, if you don't respect African-American soldiers as soldiers under the laws of war, we won't respect your prisoners as soldiers under the laws of war. So there is a huge conversation taking place about what is military incarceration, 
how to do it legally and humanely, and under what in what context is it justified? Um, some of this goes even back to just war theories, which are foundational European colonialism, right? If you're and this is particularly true with Native Americans, uh, one of the things you when you read the sources. Uh, White Americans have this phrase that lives in American culture, actually, where they talk about groups like the Apache as being on the war path. Though so you see the war path, that phrase come up over and over again. And what it means legally is if, if Apache people are on a war path, they can be legitimately executed and enslaved and imprisoned, right? Because they've declared war on the state. So there's a lot of thinking about what, it, what, what, the, what justifies US military action. In the South, one of the things that's interesting is the way in which Northern liberal sort of penal reform ideas make their way South. And you see this in the evolution of Southern punishment from the convict lease system to the chain gang, to the prison farm, to the penitentiary. And it takes a little bit of time, but Northern prison administrators play a major role in helping the South figure out how to, how to, how to manage these prisons. So yeah, there is a conversation taking place. Um, I would say there's also there's some there's some discord between northern prison reformers and southern prison administrators. So it's not that it's sort of like a neat relationship. Mm -hmm. They look at the South and they see savagery and barbarism and how come the South can't modernize? Right, so they definitely, it's not that Northerners give advice that's taken seamlessly, but they, they do give advice and they share ideas and then they also uh, judge the South as being backward and archaic, uh, which does force a change eventually. Questions, comments, criticisms? Thank you. Any more questions, no, are we done? Well, maybe I'll just do this then, there's no more questions. Well, this is some more of the art. And where did you find, where's that from? It's fascinating. Yeah, it, there's a, <laughs> I found a lot, interestingly, I found a lot of my sources by looking through the U.S. Park Service and then figuring out where they got some of their information. And then I had to go track down certain archives. So the U.S. Park Service, because a lot of these old military forts and even Alcatraz, right, are now like historic sites. That's where I was like, I was sort of like, well, how do they get their story? And the, the story they tell on their website is always limited, but they sometimes give you uh, leads to where to find the sources. These, I forget the exact name of the archive I found them, but they're actually on a digital collection. Oh, include, it's like one of these digital collections that no one uses. But you, I please, please. I just please. wanted to know, like, so who, if you could just reiterate who drew these exactly? These are prisoners of war from the Red River War in the Texas Panhandle. So they're primarily Cayenne, Kiowa, and Comanche peoples. So these are these are the, the drawings of uh, the indigenous people who were incarcerated at Fort Marion and St. Augustine. Um, and they're drawing representations of themselves in some in some. Yeah, places. and one I mean one of the things they're trying to do, and this goes back to the carceral aspect of it too, right? Is is they make them work sometimes. Sometimes they just allow them, they just kind of hold them or warehouse them. But they also bring teachers. So the same northern missionaries that are going south to teach emancipated African Americans are going to these jails in Florida to teach Native Americans. And this is uh, this, right? Which is, a, which, so, and so these drawings are in part my sense, this is, this is what I read and I, I think it's probably true, the drawings were part of the classroom exercise. Right, which again, even these drawings, we have to be aware that they're being done under duress, right? So they're 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 powerful, but they're also they're kind of captive knowledge. Um, in some ways, they're so powerful because uh, the, the voices captured in the record are so one-sided, yes. directional in some yep. ways, right? Yep. So this is interesting, but it also there's a lot of, as you know, I'm I'm sure many in the room know better than myself. There's scholars in youth and gender, uh, youth and children's studies mm. that look comprehensively about uh, on these kinds of sources and how to use them. So yeah. I think they're so... Um, That's helpful, actually, because I think, I think in some ways, there's, a, there's an argument I want to tell in this work for 
that has particular sets of historiographical and political stakes, but I think there's also a kind of subtext or a story here about sources and how sources are made and how what obligations do we as historians have in using those sources and how do we handle them. So I think actually you're reminding me that I, I will look that up, but also that I need to foreground that aspect of this story, right? What does it mean to use sources? I mean, historians of slavery and, and, and also Native Ameri historians of Native America have, have done good work on this, I think, to sort of, you know, how do you, how do you use sources that are, you know, European-produced sources, right, mediated by European voices? How do you read against the grain and sort of use moments of what I would might call a frustrated power? So moments when those in power express frustration is usually a great moment to see that the people that they're trying to wield power over are pushing back in some interesting ways or challenging or evading. Or, so I think really maybe foregrounding some of that methodological stuff. That's helpful. I just wanted to show you guys. This is, so if you think of the map of the United States, the story I told is really about people in Arizona being sent to Florida and then the children being sent to Pennsylvania. But there's another, I mean, there's just unfortunately countless stories. But there's an, the other story that could be told is the one of Hopi peoples, also from Arizona. And this is a photo of their arrest in the 1890s. And the Hopi are interesting because they were considered, quote unquote, friendlies by the United States. They were not on the war path. But US soldiers started going to the Hopi reservation and strongly encouraging them to send their children to residential schools. And they refused. And there was a group of Hopi that were so opposed to it that they became labeled hostiles. And the US Army went and arrested them. And this is their arrest. And this is the group of 19 Hopi men arrested for trying to keep their children from being taken to residential schools after they've been shipped via the railroad to Alcatraz. So the Hopi are actually in car the fir one of the first Native Americans to be incarcerated, one of the first group of people to be incarcerated in Alcatraz after the Civil War are Native Americans and the Hopi, but there's also Modoc and other peoples from California, and it worked. When the, when the soldiers went back to the Hopi reservation, uh, they took a whole group of children to the Sherman Institute in Southern California, which was a forced, a carceral space too, right? So you could literally start with any group of Native Americans and it would be a similar story that would map onto the entire United States. California, Washington, Utah, Minnesota, Oklahoma. I mean, the Apache themselves end up in Oklahoma at Fort Sill, which by the way, and this will be my last point, Fort Sill, which was the last carceral space that the Apache were uh, held in, uh, is one of the main places that the US government was proposing sending migrant children and families detained at the border. So it comes full circle, right? Uh, anyway, thank you. I'm happy to talk to you afterwards too.